Okay. Uh, good evening, one and all. Uh, on behalf of the entire PIC team, I welcome you to the roundtable discussion on the policy paper, Industry 4.0, a roadmap for India's global leadership. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to join us today. Uh, and to make sure we are helping you as best as we can on this policy paper on Industry 2.0, we have a chat box uh, to source your questions. Uh, feel free to drop questions on the topic and we will answer them for you at the end of the uh, discussion. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to the uh, our chairperson and uh, the guest speakers and the panelists. Uh, to start with our president, Pune International Center, Dr. R. A. Mashalkar. Dr. Mashalkar uh, is uniquely a multifaceted. Uh, in 1998, the scientist received JRD Tata Corporate Leadership Award, an exclusive honor reserved for Indian corporates. In 1998, he also I was elected as a fellow of Royal Society, the topmost honor reserved for world's path-breaking scientist. He is a director on boards of India's leading companies from Tata's to Reliance. 36 global universities have bestowed honorary doctorate on him. As its leader, Marshall Kursar transformed CSIR, the world's largest chain of laboratories, heralded as one of the top 10 achievements of India science, Indian science and technology in the 20th century. He has received Padma Vibhushan at the hands of President of India and Star of Asia at the hands of George Bush, senior former US President. Our presenter of the paper today is Dr. Arvind Chinsure, who is the CEO of Deshpande Startups and founder of QLeap Academy. He holds a PhD in physics with 30 years of experience in R&D, technology, innovation, intellectual property, entrepreneurship, business strategy. Uh, our, Arvind, Dr. Arvind Chanchure is a member of advisory board of Global Research Projects and has served as international expert IP and innovation for the World Bank to advise South Asian country. He has authored 28 research articles published in international journals and has filed four patents. His latest book, as you can see, uh, The New Age Organization, offers a breakthrough framework for all organizations to navigate rapid disruption and lead in the fourth industrial revolution. Then we have our panelist, Dr. Ijaz Ghani, who is currently a senior fellow at Pune International Center. He was previously lead economist at the World Bank and has worked uh, on Africa, East Asia, South Asia corporate strategy and independent evaluation unit. He contributes economic opinion columns to Business Standard, Hindu Financial Express, Mint, VOX, CEPR and Project Syndicates. He also has edited several books. The other panelist is Mr. Madhukar V. Kotwal. Uh, he's a graduated, uh, he's graduated mechanical engineering from the University of Mumbai and joined LNT in 1968 uh, and uh, works, uh, Powai works and retired in August 2016 as a whole time director on LNT's board after nearly 47 years of his service. He was responsible for two divisions of the LIT, uh, LNT group. Mr. Kotwal, a fellow of INEA, Indian National Academy of Engineers, has participated in several apex bodies. Uh, Mr. Kotwal is a member of governing council of INEA and chairman of its Pune chapter and is a member of Pune International Center. He's a member of DAE Board of Research in Nuclear Science and independent director on board of Sangvi Motors Limited and Kirloskar Ferris Industries Limited and founder director of Nutantra Private Limited. We have with us Mr. Amit Paranspe, uh, who is an entrepreneur and technology professional with over three decades of experience in software industry. He worked in manufacturing, retail, healthcare, with special focus on supply chain management. He's an early stage startup investor and mentor. Varied general interest across multiple areas, technology, healthcare, public policy, geopolitics, history, economics, and infrastructure. Our uh, guest speaker and panelist is uh, Rujuta uh, Jakta, who is the executive director of Saj Test Plant Private Limited, who also is a second generation entrepreneur. Saj is into manufacturing of test equipments like dynamometers, control systems, data acquisition softwares, and many more. Rujuta has prior experience with Tata Steel Mumbai, handling their international sales and marketing for all global markets and domestic sales and marketing for institutional business in, Ma in Maharashtra. She is the first woman chair of the Indian American Chamber of Commerce in the year 2021 and director on the board of MCCI. She's also a vice 
uh, chairman of Indo-American Chamber of Commerce. So without uh, taking more time, uh, I would now request Dr. Chinsure to take it over from here. Over to, over to you, sir. So thank you, Mandar. It's such an honor and privilege to be part of uh, this, uh, uh, you know, panelist, uh, eminent, eminent panelist. And of course, uh, my guru and mentor, Dr. Mashakar, always when I see him, uh, it's always an inspiration. And uh, today, if I have to say uh, what led me uh, to write policy paper, I think the credit goes to Dr. Mashakar. Because, you know, like a student, I have learned how he has been uh, able to contribute both nationally and internationally. Sir, thank you very much uh, for all your support, guidance and encouragement and blessings. So with this, um, uh, let me start uh, uh, a brief uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, this brief presentation is to just give some background uh, and context to this uh, very important strategic policy paper that we undertook uh, in PIC. PIC. So, uh, and then also I will share uh, the core framework, uh, which is a part of this uh, uh, policy uh, framework. So I will spend some 10 to 12 minutes. And of course, uh, we have a very eminent, uh, diverse, uh, experienced panelists uh, from, uh, from World Bank uh, to MSME, to representing large company and also very, very multifaceted uh, uh, personalities. So uh, let me uh, uh, begin with uh, sharing uh, uh, why, why do we need to think uh, about uh, fourth industrial revolution and, uh, and what is it that uh, we need to do to make uh, this nation a very developed, India a developed and prosperous nation. I was just going through the news articles, uh, uh, very, very recent news articles, and, uh, and one of the very prominent news uh, article that uh, came across uh, different media uh, with a headline. Uh, headline was that uh, India is preparing a blueprint to achieve a $40 trillion economy by 2047. And I understand that the government of India has constituted several uh, groups uh, and, uh, and each group is providing uh, direction uh, and, uh, and a roadmap and a blueprint so that as a nation, we achieve uh, this uh, 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 achieve a, a country with the $40 trillion uh, uh, GDP. And we have been uh, discussing about this. Uh, we started with making India $5 trillion economy, $10 trillion economy, but now our aspiration is to become a $40 trillion economy by uh, 2047. Now to achieve uh, this kind of uh, aspiration, uh, we need some bold ideas uh, and thought thoughtful uh, plans uh, so that uh, we achieve uh, uh, to become a very, very prosperous and developed uh, nation by 2047 when India becomes, uh, uh, you know, 100 years uh, after independence. Let me just briefly talk about uh, the four industrial revolutions uh, in the last uh, few centuries uh, and what has been the impact of these industrial revolutions uh, on India. The first industrial revolution that was powered by mechanization uh, from steam power that began in 1780 uh, and uh, in, 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 in UK and uh, exactly 100 years, uh, almost 100 years, we saw the second industrial revolution uh, uh, somewhere around 1870 and that was powered mainly by electricity and we as an industry went into the mass uh, production, assembly line production and so on. And that changed the entire industry, entire paradigm of doing the uh, business. Again, after hundred years, we saw the third industrial revolution uh, in 1970. And that was due to our internet uh, 
computers and IT and automation. And then now from somewhere around 2013, we say that we are leaving in the fourth uh, industrial revolution. It's very interesting to see that uh, how this, these industrial revolutions have impacted in the, in the growth and economy of, uh, of India. Very interestingly, uh, uh, the first industrial revolution and second industrial revolution, our economic growth declined. One of the reasons the economic growth declined the, uh, is because we did not participate in the first two industrial revolution. In 1970, we as a nation became independent and we participated in the third industrial revolution and whatever growth that you see in India uh, from IT industry, pharma industry, automotive industry, and many sectors uh, that led to the economic growth, uh, 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 a steady economic growth uh, uh, in India. But what I see is that uh, India has the potential uh, to prepare and lead in the fourth uh, uh, industrial uh, uh, revolution. Now, just if I look at the, the economic growth of, of different countries during uh, uh, first industrial revolution to third industrial revolution, there is very, very interesting revolution, uh, revolution that you can uh, uh, find. So if you look at India's uh, 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 contribution uh, to the global GDP during pre-industrial area, was as high as 22%. Uh, so India, in that sense, was a very, very economically prosperous uh, uh, nation. And then, uh, right at the beginning of the first industrial revolution, India lost the Plassey's battle in 1857, and it came under the rule of East India Company. And then you see that, uh, that India's growth started declining. When we came to the second industrial revolution, by the time we were under British rule, and then we looked at, uh, when you look at the third industrial revolution, during that India became a free nation and India could really participate in the industrial, uh, uh, third industrial revolution. Whereas if you look at uh, say country like uh, UK, UK, uh, prior to uh, pre-industrial era, their economy was very small, very tiny, but you see that their economic growth substantially increased both in the first industrial revolution and second industrial revolution. What surprises me is uh, US. US did not even exist or in that sense economically visible in the first industrial revolution, but US took a lead in the second industrial revolution and you see the kind of economic growth uh, that US could, uh, could achieve. So what I see a direct correlation between the pre-industrial era and post-industrial era and countries who participated or were part of these industrial revolution, they managed to economically uh, grow and the countries which did not participate in this industrial uh, revolutions, their economy started uh, uh, declining. Now, the question is, uh, how do we as uh, uh, India prepare ourselves to uh, lead in the fourth industrial revolution? I see that this is the first time as a nation, we have the right resources technological power, right talent, and entrepreneurial spirit to see that we can, in fact, prepare and lead in the fourth industrial revolution. And perhaps we can even have a potential to define the fifth industrial revolution. But for this, we need a framework. We need a model, a, 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 a holistic uh, uh, approach to achieve that uh, leadership. So this particular policy paper, what we have tried is we said that we need to have three major uh, missions 
I call this as the mission 2025. We need to accomplish certain things by 2025 so that we are prepared to grow in the next uh, decade, that is uh, uh, 2035. And based on the, on the success of this second stage, then we can actually prepare, uh, actually we lead in the fourth industrial revolution. So uh, I, I, I said after a lot of uh, uh, thinking and looking at various possibilities and the contest that, uh, uh, that we are in uh, uh, in India, and when I looked at various uh, initiatives by different countries, developed countries, developing countries, large countries, small countries, Western countries and Eastern countries, I found that every nation today is investing uh, to prepare and lead in the fourth industrial revolution. And I thought we need to have our own uh, 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 blueprint or a game plan to succeed. So in the first mission 2025, we need to ensure that we initiate certain capability buildings that will lead to establishing uh, them as our core capabilities. For example, when I look at, uh, 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 say, uh, by, uh, in the next two to three years, as a nation, we need to be focusing on, on digital and data and, and, and ensuring that we will use sensors and automation. The whole focus of this uh, initiate to establish uh, phase is to ensure that, uh, that we become actively part of digital economy and also uh, ensure that we are at least industry 3.0 compliant and be prepared for uh, uh, industry 4.0. And in the next uh, uh, decade, we need to ensure that whatever core capabilities that we have built in the first phase, we integrate and, and build connected and smart products, services, and platforms. This is the phase uh, where Industry 4.0 becomes a very, very critical. And my gut feel is that 4.0 will peak uh, during this, uh, this uh, decade. And once we have these connected small products, services, and platforms, we should now start thinking how can we multiply uh, by, uh, uh, in, uh, by networking and uh, these core capabilities so that we build very intelligent, uh, autonomous uh, 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 network connected uh, uh, platforms and platform of platforms. This is the phase uh, India can now uh, ensure that not only we are industry 4.0 compliant, but also slowly we move towards uh, industry uh, 5.0. So these are the three uh, phases by which India can uh, start uh, planning its journey to become a uh, to to become a prosperous uh, nation. But for this, we need certain fundamentals. For example, we need to invest in uh, our digital and physical infrastructure to ensure uh, that we become digital. We start building connected and smart products and building uh, intelligent uh, platforms and platform of uh, platforms. What I have seen during my research is that India is investing heavily in building physical infrastructure. Um, there are programs where uh, uh, India is investing a lakh crore to build this physical infrastructure. Now it is very important that we, though we have a digital uh, India initiative, we need to ensure that we now invest in uh, digital infrastructure. For example, how do we quickly uh, adopt and uh, launch 5G connectivity. We also have a smart city uh, programs uh, uh, in India, and we ensure that by 2025, all these 100 smart cities are completed and meets uh, the objective of being a smart city. And from there, we need to see that in the next uh, phase, we need to integrate these physical infrastructure and digital uh, infrastructure to build smart national infrastructure. We can even think of uh, building digital twin of cities because already we have smart cities. Now, why can't we build and think of creating these uh, uh, digital twin of cities? 
we can even think of connected cities because we have smart cities uh, and uh, and now we can start looking at connecting to the towns and villages and and, and possibly we become a smart uh, uh, state and from there in the last phase we will create a, a very very uh, uh, connected network intelligent national infrastructure it possibly we can call this as a smart nation or country as a platform where everything is digitally uh, uh, connected physical infrastructure all kinds of infrastructure whether it's energy infrastructure or or or, or mobility infrastructure and so on i think if we can start building uh, this kind of a roadmap uh, i believe that we are able to achieve and lead in the fourth industrial revolution just physical and digital infrastructure is not sufficient we need to look at creating our own indigenously uh, cutting edge uh, technologies particularly the core technologies of industry 4.0 like data ai cloud uh, you know simulation and modeling and so on in this phase we need to excel today india is say somewhere uh, uh, ranked between say fourth or tenth and sixth but this is the time we need to invest uh, building the technological indigenous technological core capabilities uh, to become say top 3 in the world and then we move to the next phase where we use these technologies to build uh, platforms uh, where there are convergence of different technologies like operational technologies information technology biotechnologies to create uh, systems and platforms Uh, that will have a larger impact both to the industry and uh, and nation and once we have built this capability we need to now see whether we can move towards building intelligent sustainable self aware autonomous interconnected ecosystem of platforms and perhaps this is the time we might even uh, bring certain new concepts uh, of uh, industry 4.0 so that uh, so that we are Uh, ready to compete and uh, and 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 lead in this uh, in this era for this as an industry i feel that uh, we need to create uh, uh, and introduce uh, uh, digitalization uh, in the uh, in the both larger companies and smaller companies we actually this is the time where we can even create uh, some 25 or 100 or 50 uh industry 4.0 lighthouse uh, enterprises so that they become example for us to uh, adopt so industry should be at least 3.0 compliant uh, if not uh, they are taking the journey towards industry 4.0 but in the phase 2 they must be connected and uh, smart enterprises and here we actually take the core concept of cyber physical system product Uh, a system in 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 production and mass customization and perhaps building the new business uh, uh, models during this uh, phase and then we create this uh, this very uh, you know intelligent and autonomous enterprises where these enterprises are connected in the entire value chain of uh, of uh, industry and perhaps we will now slowly start thinking instead of having large enterprises or manufacturing things we might even start thinking whether we can build local production or distributed uh, production using more uh, local uh, uh, resources so this is just a very very basic summary of uh, this policy paper of course it is a 40 plus page very very detailed uh, description of each and every phase and what as a nation we should be uh, should be doing and in this whole process is extremely important that we build a uh, right kind of a talent or a human capital uh, to uh, ensure that uh, that we succeed in this uh, in this uh, journey uh, of becoming a leader in the fourth industrial revolution so just to conclude and uh, so so the previous revolution uh, decided uh, the uh, the development of a nation so i feel that i strongly feel that uh, this industrial revolution will also decide the development trajectory of nation now the question that i have is will india uh, 
take this once in a century opportunity to propel the country into prosperous and developed a nation. If I talk to uh, and listen to Dr. Mashalkar or many thought leader and industry leaders, or to that matter, even being in Hubli and looking at the young entrepreneurs who are developing some of the cutting edge solutions, I think it is possible. So my answer to this question is yes, India can do it and it can, India can take this opportunity and lead in the fourth uh, uh, industrial uh, uh, revolution. So let me uh, stop. Uh, I know uh, uh, I took a little bit more time than expected, but it was very important that uh, that I give uh, the context why this is necessary and uh, what is the policy paper talks about. So uh, let me take a pause and uh, and um, uh, now we have this uh, uh, this uh, uh, panel uh, for the round table. So. Uh, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Ghani uh, to uh, make uh, his presentation uh, for uh, around this theme and also uh, what is it that we should be uh, doing uh, as a nation uh, to lead in the in this uh, era. Over to you, Dr. Ghani. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear too well. I, I, are you suggesting that? I say a few words. Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Gandhi, um, you have um, Shall I come a little later? I don't have a presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come up later on in the discussion. I mean, the key question is, you have set forward a vision. How will India achieve that? Is something I'll focus later on. Yes, please. So uh, then may I request... Uh, uh, Ms. Rujuta Jaktab, she is the person who represents uh, MSME. Uh, she runs her own uh, uh, enterprise and also she's very, very active both uh, at MCCI Industry Association and also Indo-American Chamber of Commerce. So, uh, uh, Rujuta, over to you to share your thoughts, ideas uh, about, uh, about this policy and overall from industry perspective. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chinsure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mashekar, and uh, the rest of the colleagues, Dr. Ghani, uh, Dr. Koswal, um, Ransby, as well as Mandar, and the team of PIC for inviting me here to join the panel. Um, I would be, of course, speaking from the MSME perspective because I belong to an uh, MSME. I am an MSME enterprise. Uh, so firstly, uh, at the very outset, uh, thank you all. Uh, as we all know that MSMEs are... Uh, a sizable segment of our economy comprising some 60 million enterprises and contributing to 45% of the country's total manufacturing output. Uh, the ground reality is that our businesses will not exist in the future if we don't make the shift now to Industry 4.0. Because especially the MSMEs are the ones who are sort of lagging behind uh, drastically on uh, embarking on this journey I would say, of Industry 4.0 for various reasons uh, and challenges, which I will touch upon in my presentation a few minutes later. Uh, technology is moving so rapidly, causing a complete disruption in the manufacturing sector that I've seen. And the new practices are evolving every single day. And if we don't learn and implement them, we will not only be left behind, but also become obsolete and irrelevant in times to come. So actually, why is it so important for the MSMEs uh, to implement uh, industry 4.0. So there are certain re a few reasons for it which I'd like to just uh, touch upon. We all know that the heart of the industry 4.0 technology plays a very significant role. However, our view is that ramifications of industry 4.0 will be far reaching in the years to come. And leading global uh, manufacturers have already been uh, embarking on this journey, adopting these practices. And we see multitude of them actually uh, already in the market. And yet these multiple questions in the minds of MSMEs like ours as to what extent would our businesses be impacted? When is the right time to start embarking on this journey? How would it really make our businesses more competitive? Is there a way to guarantee ROI on Industry 4.0 projects? And how do we handle our employees on this change management uh, journey? So these are the questions that come to all MSMEs minds. And uh, these are actually classic business questions beyond technology as well. 
So I'd like to just now uh, share my presentation with this uh, precursor, just a moment. Yes. So is it visible in the slideshow? Yes, please. Yes, Rujita. Right. So, of course, um, we all know uh, the, of course, Dr. Chinsuri touched upon uh, the transitioning of uh, the different revolutions that, that we've had so far and uh, what they all entailed and how we have to progress ahead. So I wouldn't uh, sp spend much of time here. What is the Industry 4.0 gamut? So we, of course, know, uh, most of all of us actually know about this, the umbrella uh, that we have under Industry 4.0 and the technologies that exist under it, right from artificial intelligence, machine learning, Internet of Things, RFID technologies, digital twinning, 3D printing, and so on and so forth. There are ample number of them. And for MSMEs, there would be a lot of them which would be very befitting to their enterprises, depending on the industries that they're in. So let's look at the current status actually of industry 4.0 in India. We are actually looking at almost uh, 13, uh, 13 lakh 90,000 crore by 2023 is what we are expecting that India should achieve in, in terms of uh, industry 4.0 implementations. US, China, Japan, UK, Ireland, Sweden, and Austria are already way ahead on this journey. And we in India are lagging behind. That's the current reality. We being the sixth largest manufacturing country, we still need to focus more on this platform. We have been focusing on Make in India and other um, initiatives of the government, but Industry 4.0 needs to be given a special focus now. The government aims to actually augment uh, the share of manufacturing um, in GDP to 25% from the current 17%, as we all know. Uh, another aspect which uh, we are looking at is basically, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of MSMEs having standalone systems in their organizations, which are actually completely um, independent of each other. For instance, a lot of uh, organizations don't even have ERPs in their organizations. So embarking on Industry 4.0 is going to be quite a, a tough challenge for them. So that is the current situation. Also, integration of these physical systems on the cyber platforms. Because all these, you know, companies are in their very much infancy stage uh, when it comes to any kind of digitalization in their organizations. So micro, small, medium, that's MSME platforms or MSME organizations or SME organizations have little access to automation technology due to high cost barrier, which is one of the major roadblocks that we've seen. The other challenges which we see all across MSMEs is non-awareness of technology. Typically, most of them are not aware what are the technologies under Industry 4.0, which are the ones relevant to their business enterprises, and which are the ones that they need to start off and how that journey should be undertaken. They don't have a systematic approach most of the times towards modernization because it's more on a case-to-case -case basis and more on a need basis. That's what we've seen. And typically there's a lot of uh, sort of non-willingness to adopt new technologies because most of the MSMEs may have uh, a um, you know, employees across the runs, people who've been experienced, but they are not very much system oriented and the newer uh, generations. So it's, it's a mix of millennials and uh, baby movers, as well as, um, uh, you know, experienced uh, manpower, which, which actually is a little, um, you know, hesitant to change and embark on any kind of digitalization platform because of uh, the risk that they associate with it when it comes to, um, you know, changing, otherwise become redundant, so make the change or become redundant. So that's the risk they look at. Uh, availability of cheap labor in India um, is another aspect due to which MSMEs are reluctant to actually adopt automation because they directly uh, relate that to an expense. Volumes of products is not very high and then and hence the perception or the myth is if it's a discrete manufacturing niche company and not into batch production, then Industry 4.0 is not for me or not for us. That's the kind of myth they're uh, looking at. And non-availability of skill set uh, to adopt this automation. Clearly, there is a lack of uh, clear digital vision in these organizations, uh, lack of data analytical capabilities because they don't really have, uh, you know, a, a full-fledged IT department. They work with um, smaller, uh, you know, uh, ADP departments, which don't have those capabilities. They don't have a digital culture. They don't have a digital footprint. They don't have, uh, you know, any kind of visibility in that direction. 
data security they they're very very um, uh, averse to cloud platforms also because they are you know uh, they think that's associated with risk of letting go of their technology and um, that's the reason they don't get on and lack of standardization so typically they they think msmes think automation is only for the larger organizations the investment is directly proportional to the uh, investment capacity so unless and until msmes are going to expand they may not want to invest into automation typically technology companies uh, need to actually understand the issues of smes and customize their solutions so typically uh, you know the solutions that the it companies would come out with or any kind of industry uh, 4.0 um uh, implementation companies will come out with they need to tailor their uh, solutions to the msmes for the msmes to actually gain confidence and for them to have a buy in and typically physical and emotional wellness of people is another aspect that needs to be addressed msmes coming from different domains typically as i mentioned earlier there are discrete manufacturing companies batch production companies and niche uh, companies which basically want references so an msme would typically uh, would want a parallel reference into their similar kind of industries where is that implementation happen only then will they be convinced and that's when they will actually you know want to make that uh, step ahead so that is something that that uh, definitely is, is seen in all the msmes um end to end hand holding very important because uh, unless and until there's end to end hand holding and training um, you know these companies will not get on board automation is always directly as i mentioned the proportion to cost implications and hence the 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 hesitation what are the suggestions that we're looking at uh, when it comes to getting uh, you know higher success in implementation of um, industry 4.0 in msmes well um, we need to focus on um, you know the human element so we know india is a huge uh, population and we can't really have uh, uh, you know automation wherein there will be redundancy of human workforce because that will not work so we'll actually have to have uh, you know improving the efficiencies of human workforce which will definitely be um, enabled by technology and moving from the selling of the product to subscribing model i think this is another area that uh, will work a lot of um, you know uh, smaller organizations can't really put in the capital uh, investment up front but if you have an option of doing a subscription model or as they have in erp the software as a service model then definitely we uh, would definitely have more traction and more demand that we see and more companies will come ahead to take on the subscription model for this the government should actually incentivize the renting policies in this direction with lower interest rate so definitely a, a higher adoption will be seen because entry barrier uh, on the cost front is taken care of uh, the other suggestions uh, the government from the government front uh, what i would uh, you know uh, i mean what we uh, all the msmes have been really resonating this point of view is the government should actually be setting up uh, you know which they are working of course they are doing these things setting up dedicated wings where the overseeing of um, the industry 4.0 adoption is happening there are test labs which the government's uh, talking about setting up and a lot of them are being set up as well where actually um, you know the industry bodies government academia labor organizations all would be the entire ecosystem will be a part of this and uh, not only that these test labs should actually connect with test labs uh, across the globe which are benchmark test labs for actually sharing the best practices emulating actually um, the best practices that they have there so that we can actually instead of reinventing the wheel we can actually jump across uh, uh, the, that curve and uh, get on uh, you know front of the technology curve is what i would say and uh, as a policy maker the government should look at as i mentioned financial incentives to msmes like tax breaks subsidies to you know make this more affordable uh, continue the push with uh, initiatives like smart cities uh, digital india make in india industry 4.0 also needs it needs a constant push in this direction uh again government is actually uh, putting the indian uh, of course msme sector at the forefront because uh, this definitely is one of the largest sectors that we have in india contributing to the manufacturing sector and um, this would need funds infrastructure technical know how and exposure uh, in different areas uh, improving telecommunication infrastructure will go a long way for seamless integration of uh, iot implementation Uh, formulating adequate cyber security policies, which will address their concerns on security, encouraging FDI and improving the ease of doing business in this, and involving the stakeholders is very much needed. Uh, these are some of the policies. I will not elaborate on these. These are the policies that government has already announced uh, in this direction, which definitely would be is a huge plus. National manufacturing policy, center of excellence, national program on artificial intelligence, mission on cyber physical systems, etc. 
uh, and academia. So when we come to, of course, uh, uh, industry 4.0 implementation, we definitely would need uh, fresh, uh, uh, you know, people from the academia who are experienced at least theoretically on uh, on these technologies. And of course, if they've worked with companies who've already implemented these, that goes a long way as well. So. With the academia, these are the expectations that the MSMEs have, that there should be enhanced quality of teachers and modernizing the, uh, you know, learning infrastructure there. The teachers should be actually uh, also working with the uh, industries to get the actual uh, implementations and teach that to their students of how it's actually, what are the challenges, how is it uh, getting implemented. The real uh, experience, the theoretical experience should come out from the practical experience that they've had with the industry. So we would urge the faculties to actually also work parallelly with the industry as well. Aligning the courses uh, or the curriculum in tandem with industry 4.0 requirements, which is uh, going to be uh, realistic and uh, more dynamic and with change with the changing needs of the industry and relevant with the um, updated uh, content. Focusing more on practical result-oriented knowledge over theoretical and promoting a culture of research in um, upcoming uh, areas like industry 4.0 and to act as testbeds of innovation and new learning. Participating actively in uh, the massive open online courses is, is very important and collaborating with industry peers. The last, uh, uh, I mean, last few slides are uh, basically the benefits that MSMEs will get by embarking on this journey of industry 4.0 are immense. Some of them I've just uh, highlighted here uh, would of course lead to uh, major labor productivity and quality of the products manufactured. Also, demand for the products uh, manufactured will go up and thereby the capacity to meet the demand and therefore there would be more uh, job opportunities. Low skill jobs will be eliminated, but there will be more jobs created by upskilling um, yourself in this direction. And uh, increasing the capacity will have a positive effect, uh, as I mentioned, the job creation. It automatically leads to enhancement or improvement in productivity, quality equipment, uptime, inventory management, safety, and multiple other benefits. And of course, sensor-based automation in the organization's connectivity, data analytics, some of the most popular ones that MSMEs are looking for. Lastly, uh, these are the eight focus areas that all the organizations should look into while embarking on the journey of smart manufacturing. So these, these basically are just to touch upon these briefly when it comes to uh, business shifts. So we talked about this earlier, they need to make the transition, they need to ensure that the manpower is um, reorganized and restructured in the businesses to align with the needs of the industry 4.0. On the technology front, it'll um, you know cover the evaluation and selection of the technologies that are aptly suited to your organization. So not all other technologies would be relevant, the ones which are relevant need to be adopted. In the data, on the data analytics front, as we know, data is the foundation of any industry 4.0 um, you know, um, uh, initiative. And therefore we need to ensure that this is used to its full potential. Connected systems, we need to ensure um, you know, it'll involve convergence of IT and OT and taking the shop floor to the top floor. Talent readiness, which I talked about earlier, would need we need to upskill our uh, manpower, or the existing ones, to learn and adopt these new technologies. And on the innovation front, digitalization provides opportunities, but if you want to make your businesses truly smart and connected, innovation is a must. In our products, processes, this needs to be leveraged to help in transforming our businesses positively. Safety and security of people, assets, and cyber safety are going to be critical in the Industry 4.0 environment, where not only organizations, but also nations are facing a threat. And lastly, business processes need to be aligned and revamped over the conventional business processes in tune with the digital world, because only that will lead to successful implementation of Industry 4.0. So thank you uh, all for your patience and your time. Thank you so much. Uh, so Thank you, Rujita. I think you gave an introduction, you know, to the industry 4.0, uh, the challenges that MSME and as an industry that you face, and then what is, uh, you know, potential opportunities and what kind of roadmap that one should look at when uh, implementing industry 4.0. So thank you very much. I know that we have, you know, done 45 minutes, uh, just uh, just the introduction part. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, Dr. Gani, would you like to come now or uh, should sure, we? Sure, sure, sure. Yes, I please. can come. I, yes. This is an excellent panel discussion and I've learned a great deal from it. Dr. Arvind, you have provided a vision on how technology is going to evolve 
over the next two decades and what india you know india is likely to follow that technological path the big question said how will it be achieved and some of the questions i've been watching on the question answer sessions how will it help or hinder india uh, questions like is it just about modern services or manufacturing is it about jobs or lack of jobs uh, so on and so forth so i would like to focus on some of the evidence to answer some of the questions that are emerging in this from the vision that you have put forward you know first is this industry revolution 4 is not just about services it will also impact manufacturing in recent decades services are acquiring the traits of manufacturing and manufacturing is acquiring the traits of services when you sell a car you also sell the service of computer enabled service and update and upkeep of the motor vehicle so it's it's merging so it's about both the manufacturing and the services sector and how the digital revolution for infrastructure will impact uh, how will it be achieved i think you know policy makers will need to scale up investments both in physical infrastructure and human infrastructure the your agenda you know did seem to suggest that we there is a need to really move on to modern forms of technology scale up the digital infrastructure what we also need to emphasize and that is where the strength of india is is india's youth bulge you know as dr marshelker said sweden won on forestry india is going to win on it the youth of india you know if they can have access to education and skills they are the big champions that's already happening in the big diaspora of india globally we see that all we need to do is to scale up investments in education domestically so that the whole country benefits and achieves the vision of 2047 you have in mind the next question that comes up is, you know, what about jobs? Will enough jobs be created? I mean, we did examine this and, you know, there's a long standing debate of, you know, do create more job or modern services. We looked at the ASI NSS data and clearly more jobs are being created in the modern services sector. But it's not modern services versus manufacturing. India has to take off on both manufacturing and services and take advantage of the industrial revolution for to propel higher growth as more jobs both in manufacturing and services saw the concern on smes being raised i mean 80 percent of the jobs in india are in the micro and small scale enterprises how will the industrial revolution for impact the majority of small scale enterprises now looked at this hard evidence you know over the last two decades question where are the micro enterprises growing in india and we found that most of the job micro enterprises in the last two decades took place in the tradable sector contracting in the non-tradable sector tradable sector is the export import so the there is an explosion of micro enterprises in the tradable sector which is benefiting from global supply chains outsourcing technology so we need to just keep marching ahead you know there are a couple of things missing which we need to add on industrial revolution vision four one is you know the role of urbanization in this in order to achieve this the tier two tier three cities will need to explode you know i mean i come from sivan the poorest place in bihar and i'm speaking now from uh, gurgaon the cyber city which was a village 10 years back today it is a cyber city it has taken off so if every village in india 
achieves the role of industrial revolution four and become get the platform i think it's got to just take off so we need to bring in the role of urbanization tier two tier three cities in the industrial revolution agenda uh, we also need to bring in the role of digital divide there is still a huge digital divide within the country and that needs to be overcome this digital divide is between leading states and lagging states mega cities versus tier three cities men entrepreneurs versus women entrepreneurs overall many of the questions are an integral industrial force india youth bulge it is this youth bulge which will propel india to a much higher level thank you thank you very much uh, dr gani i think you touched very very important points that uh, that needs to be considered to achieve the vision uh, that india wants to uh, become a developed and uh, and uh, prosperous nation so you are absolutely right uh, this policy paper is not about implementation of industry 4.0 Uh, in the companies this uh, policy paper is how as a nation we should lead in the fourth industrial revolution you were absolutely right uh, about uh, manufacturing and services what we are seeing is the rise of platform businesses so new business models will get uh, get created uh, uh, across uh, the world if you look at top 5 companies in the world today they are platform uh, businesses so it's very interesting for indian organization and enterprises to see whether we build those platforms or be part of these platforms uh, as a as a, to, to succeed because that's going to be the next paradigm when it comes to uh, uh, comes to the uh, new models of uh, of uh, businesses manufacturing services you are absolutely right uh, dr gani the strength that the india has is its youth and if i look at the evolution of industry 4.0 that happened in germany uh, there is a dichotomy or there is a there is a very interesting uh, correlation one of the reason developed nation wants to have industry 4.0 implementation is because they don't have skilled labor and for that they wanted to improve the productivity and economy therefore automation or extreme automation becomes a uh, uh, imperative but in the case of india we have to adapt to industry 4.0 but we have 600 million people who are willing or who are going to be part of uh, uh, jobs it's a very interesting and one of the ways uh, the policy paper talks about is can india become a talent factory for the world but for this as you said we need to have a right skilling uh, right education system our vocational education i think that is going to be very very critical otherwise it's going to create a lot of uh, 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 challenges so of course you know every point is so important either uh, i will think about it and add and i will have a separate discussion with you but thank you very much for uh, uh, for your uh, uh, inputs so uh, of course there are a lot of questions uh, in the chat box uh, uh, we will look at those uh, questions and then respond uh, as we proceed uh, with this uh, round table so thank you uh, dr gani now comes uh, you know dr kothwal i think you have seen large industry like lng for example uh, massive uh, indian multinational so so uh, knowing large other industries and you are contributing to uh, being on the board of some, of kirloskar and many other companies so uh, let me let us all hear about your thoughts comments about uh, how india can lead in the fourth industrial revolution thank you very much uh, dr chinchure and uh, been really uh, my task has become very much simpler after the excellent presentations both from the msme side as well as covering some of the issues which really are critical for indian growth i would like to start with a little bigger picture i would like to pick up on the statement made in your report dr chinchure as to where are we headed what do we want to be after 100 years 
and used uh, very good words advanced and prosperous nation now you know if you really dive a little deeper and then look at the total advancement of a nation like india then i think it's a far departure from mere trillions and how many millions or trillions you are producing and therefore in addition to i am not saying as a substitute but in addition to whatever targets are given in terms of gdp terms or in terms of the trillions of dollars we want to become and therefore become leading economies i think there are a few crucial questions which we have to add on into the same metrics now these could be of two types one is the social type and the second is the environment now when you come to the social aspects one um, thing i was really looking at and i was a bit disappointed to find very uh, in fact you look at the inequality i am sure all of us will agree that as we have progressed the inequality in the country has not really reduced and now if you look at just inequality rating itself there is a very good rating system which is on three pillars one is public services which are the spending that is there on education health and social protection this is one pillar the second is on a progressive tax pillar how is the nation and the members of the nation taxed are they taxed fairly and so on the third pillar is the workers rights pillar okay the labor rights and fair wages and so on women's rights minimum wages so on so these are the parameters now interestingly there are 155 countries covered in this index system and in the first pillar public services we rank 141 out of 155 now coming to the second one which i was very happy to note that we are number 19 i was i couldn't believe this that on the taxation issue because obviously of the recent past and the many measures which have taken place supported by a very high end technology framework that is the reason why we have probably ranked higher but in the last one the workers rights labor rights fair wages we are 151 now on the whole we rank somewhere like 139 now let us stop here to think that what do we want to be as a nation in say 2047 do we want to say that we have a 40 trillion economy yes we are and i'm sure with all those inputs that you have given there is a good direction for that but are we going to be happy with that are we going to be is the nation going to be really advancing and becoming more prosperous in its entirety now here i want to make a as you rightly said i have been exposed to larger industries and so on but i have had an opportunity to look at what really happens also in the smaller sector and in rural areas now there is a huge gap as we all know therefore what would be ideal is for all of us to put our heads together to really apply the best of these so called 4.0 technologies but in areas where they really matter if there is a smart city i would like to have a smart village and it is only when we look at that sector and then you grow that you would find that the nation will become prosperous now it is very important therefore to come up with indices i know that there are there is always a dispute whenever you talk about any index because some people will say oh that is not right they don't capture indian Uh, you know requirements and so on so let us come with an indian uh, sector indian index which captures these various factors and like what i have learnt in the industry nothing works without p d c a plan do check and act there is nothing which is which is a policy which will work forever it has to be checked out with feedback and therefore what we need is a very strong feedback loop for which our plan we make very often we look at programs which are launched with great intentions but unfortunately the ground realities speak a different language and we find that the real effect of that is not felt so we need a pdca action in anything that we say i would very strongly recommend that in your own vision you would look at those aspects so the social aspect now come to the environment now we all know that we are going to be in an era which is going to be different and especially we are 2047 
the kind of impact that climate change is going to have on the country and especially the because of the huge disparity that exists we have to apply our minds on how to again apply the highest of technologies to really sort out those problems which hurt the nation at its real core now on the other side we have got excellent examples so it's not to say that we have not been doing this now look at the simple thing like the aadhaar it's the use of an excellent technology but is addressing problems which are absolutely the root grassroots problems of the country and has got capability of doing much more so it's a great innovation applied in a way which touches the lives of people you look at the recent thing of having bank accounts hundreds of thousands of bank accounts have been opened with the smallest people that is progress that is what will make india prosper because you will have distribution of that kind of a growth and the wealth and so on now come to the other side we recently had a great success story i'm sure dr marshal kar will uh, you know uh, support in fact he has been saying this in so many fora that look at the way we developed vaccines a country like india we are so proud that just a few days back the mrna vaccine developed in pune by genova pharmaceuticals has already been put up for trials so this is the power of technology this is what we have been able to achieve with the highest of technology but what is addressing the health issue so what i am trying to say is when you look at 4.0 industry 4.0 is just one small facet of it we are talking about a nation 4.0 or india 4.0 then it has got several more parts to it and this is what i would like to emphasize so when it when you talked about large industries it is quite natural in fact whatever you said for example the tech is sure not only in india but there are so many other very progressive industries and not only large large small even msmes as rujita was saying there are some who have already absorbed these technologies they are already implementing it see those people who already are educated in this do not need any great support they know what is good for them and they will progress in any case that does not require any government interaction uh, sort of any kind of intervention but look at where government intervention is required we are very very sadly lacking in research basic research the number of people who are actually employed in that now i am not talking about just the investments in laboratories there are huge investments how has it touched the lives of people how much of the private industry is involved in is able to take that so that is one part which the government has to do the second is just the sheer spread of education again using the best of technology 4.0 technologies so here i just was in fact going through the various approaches and i find and i would i'm sure you would have already seen it but unctad you know united nations conference on trade and uh, development has come out with an exceedingly good report only recently in 22 which talks about 4.0 and inclusiveness how to make those that merger happen and i think for india it is a must i was in fact quite amazed to read in your paper what japan is doing japan being such an advanced country has still got society 5.0 as the aim the major focus of their growth plan they have not forgotten that even they need to have a kind of involvement of people so now coming to the implementation part uh, i very strongly believe that implementation in a country like india india has got actually it's like a group of countries if you will with various dimensions in terms of progress so you have one i don't want to name states but you have states which are already advanced there are some states which are backward but that's a fact of life we have to get, take that whole country now when you look at a time frame what you have said by 2025 may be achieved even earlier in some areas and what you have said in 35 and 47 may not be achieved in some areas so now the time frame is not really uh, sacrosanct but the approach is and therefore each state has to come out now here i would very strongly emphasize that implementation has to be decentralized state wise you know we uh, we don't hear so much about states getting involved in this whole national effort and what we now chalk out should involve states because they know their uh, their uh, position best and that is something which needs to be emphasized and the other part is when it comes to let's say we talk about large um, industry parks getting announced a defense park a aerospace park and so on great ideas just imagine can we change our mindset can we apply the best of technologies in those parks you know have the best of infrastructure including the wifi and all those things that you need to set up smart things not in big cities it is if you leave it to natural uh, phenomena 
you'll find Bangalore is number one and then Pune will catch up and Hyderabad and all that will be the centers. That is not progress in India. Indian progress will take place when a lot of such centers occur across India, supported initially by the government and let free, provided it is backed with education. The last point I want to make is, how are we prepared to change our whole mindset? And education, I'm not talking, okay, it's great that now there is a new framework. So that gives a lot of latitude and plus a new beginning is possible. So let us put all this together, use 4.0, not as industry 4.0, but 4.0 technologies to transform India. That's what I would like to emphasize. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you touched many, many core points of this poly pa policy paper. In fact, I would like to go one by one, but with the time constraint, I will just, you're absolutely right. Uh, Mr. Kothwal, the policy paper does not talk about trillions. You will see, you read 40 pages of this, it never talks about whether 5 trillion, 10 trillion, 40 trillion. These are just notional. Uh, we think that economic growth will create, uh, you know, some, you know, poverty reduction and many other things or lead to a further development. The paper talks about inclusive and sustainable development. These two words I have repeated again and again. And Dr. Mashakar, you know, because I'm a student of Dr. Mashakar and, and he, his emphasis is all about inclusiveness. Uh, uh, we cannot go. The second uh, part is uh, about social and environmental. The 4.0 framework or a model or a technologies, they touch every SDG goals. And I've written that, that uh, every SDG goal is touched by the uh, 4.0. One of the most, say for example, uh, if you look at environmental, the 4.0, when I have a startup uh, I'm mentoring, which applies IoT uh, and other things to reduce the power consumption. A simple example, we can have very optimized utility of the uh, all the resources uh, uh, that uh, we have because we can monitor, track, predict, uh, and many other things. That's the power. So it touches the environmental and climate. Even when I say distributed manufacturing, which means that we should have a manufacturing in a place where there are local resources. Why we need to take these resources from A point to B point? I think this is uh, uh, extremely uh, important for us to see and look that uh, it becomes more sustainable, more uh, inclusive uh, in a sense. Inequality is very, very important. and. We see that, uh, you know, what Dr. Mashalkar talks about, I'm just taking his uh, thing. He says, how do we deal with inequality? He says, give access. There is a powerful statement uh, uh, from Dr. Mashalkar. He says, access equality in spite of economic inequality and gives a very good example of access to mobile phone. Look at now, whether you are a president or a chairman of a company or a small farmer, now, once you have access equality, they come into the mainstream and that leads to the economic development. You are absolutely right uh, about uh, this. Even for indi indices, the tax, the indices is less, as you said, you know, it's because of the technology and platform. And similarly, I think we need to look at democratizing education uh, uh, in a way uh, using maybe hybrid model or new model or, or other things uh, in this. I touched about smart village because we can have a smart city, but I'm saying that that smart city need to connect with the villages. All the services that are available in the city, they should also have an access to uh, villages. So the vision in the paper is how do we make a smart nation where every village is connected and every city, every state. So I'm saying, you know, go step by step from a smart city and connect to the smart state region to the smart nation. I think that will democratize all the government services, bring visibility, transparency, openness, and uh, and other things. Smart ACZ, you're absolutely right. We cannot have a ACZ because today, many manufacturing companies want to come to India, but they are saying that we are not even digital. You know, even we are not industry 3.0, how manufacturing will grow? So it's extremely important that we build those core capabilities within India so that we can attract more and more manufacturing companies uh, because of, you know, one, one plus one or geopolitical issues. We can really, really uh, uh, take government R&D. You're absolutely right. See what is happening in the R&D. I've written in the policy paper, 
Now government has invested thousands of crores in AI, say, or robotics, but we are working in isolation. In this world of Industry 4.0, we need to be connected. We need to be, you know, looking at things not discrete but holistically. Otherwise, these will be very, very discreet, and as a nation, we will not be able to uh, 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 think. So, of course, you know, I can go on discussing uh, about uh, this, but I have taken yes. that point. I will discuss I will, with you and also incorporate in the uh, in the policy paper. So, thank so you very much. So, now we request Amit uh, Amit uh, to yeah, yeah uh, present his, view, his views. Amit, uh, over to you. Yeah, I think uh, some excellent points have been made by Dr. Ghani, uh, uh, Mr. Kotwal, and uh, an excellent uh, MSME perspective by Rudhika Jaktap. So, I have very few additional things to add. I just had listed a few points uh, from different buckets uh, that I'll just talk about in the next uh, three, four minutes. Uh, so I think there was some reference in the paper about uh, hardware and uh, what we need to do in that hardware. I'm specifically talking about 5G or some of the new technology hardware. And I think uh, one of the areas where government and large industries can support this whole process is uh, being Atmanirbhar in some of these core technology areas, whether it's 5G, 6G, semiconductors. I think some of these things are foundational to a lot of the things that we are talking about. And to the extent we can focus on building those core uh, technologies, products in India, I think uh, it will be quite, uh, quite crucial. Uh, the other point that I want to make, just to step back about overall industry 4.0 and 5.0, I mean, ultimately, and it's fairly obvious to say, but uh, still needs to be said that ultimately there are core metrics that any manufacturing company or any company is looking at. Right? It's going to be lower costs, higher revenue, lower inventory, and whatever other metrics that you can come up, come up with. Right? So ultimately, you know, pushing a technology to a manufacturing company and especially to an MSME company is not always uh, very effective. Uh, the companies need to see clear benefits derived from using these technologies. And yes. to the extent that there are those top level goals for any sized company uh, and demonstrations done with successful adoption of technology to see these specific metrics. Uh, there was one reference about reduced power consumption using IoT, for example. I think those case studies and those examples need to be highlighted very effectively. Uh, in other words, for any new technology, it needs to be a pull. It can't be a push in all, all cases. I mean, we can do some groundwork for push, but uh, pure push will never work. Ultimately, they have to see, uh, the companies have to see value and economic and uh, sustainability value. Again, if that value is, uh, you know, counted in some specific sustainability goals, like again, carbon emissions and, and, and things like that. Uh, Another quick point that I would like to make is on the uh, on the upgrading basic research institutes that uh, Mr. Godwal talked about. I think that's important. We need to continue to do that. Even today, I think uh, we probably don't have some of the best manufacturing technology related uh, programs uh, in in our uh, in our colleges and universities. And IITs have some good programs, but I think a lot more lot more needs to be done in that area. And you mentioned about R&D. I think, uh, yes, it needs to be uh, done more effectively. But again, there, I would just mention an overall number for India, which is still under 1%. We're at 0.8 of GDP. That number continues to lag most uh, developed and large economies like China, US, Europe significantly. We are probably one third of US and Europe right now. So I think that number in the context of this discussion should still be brought about in terms of we still have long ways to go in the private sector as well as on the government sector in terms of investing in in these uh, in these new technologies. Uh, I'll just mention one more point. Uh, there was a reference in your paper about uh, uh, data, and I think uh, data is ultimately going to be the foundation of a lot of uh, the industry 4.0 uh, technologies that we are talking about. So, to the extent that uh, we have solutions and frameworks, both at a private company level and at a public country level of ownership of data uh, and effective and cheap ownership of data. That's very important. So for a private company, they should be able to own their data very cheaply and securely and safely. And at a macro, at a country level, we need to make sure that any foreign apps that we're using, they have uh, data islanded in India as well. And that's something that we are we are doing, but I think that needs to be made clear for any any of these new, new technologies uh, going forward. Uh, 
Uh, and the last point that I'll make is uh, one of the examples that we have talked about on some of the related panel discussion in the past is uh, is the DARPA model for driving some of these new new technologies, uh, uh, something that can be supported by the government with active help of uh, the private sector. Uh, I think that can be explored by the again by the government for some key sectors like infrastructure, uh, defense, to drive some of these new technologies uh, via academia and industry and effectively help in developing some of these uh, new technologies and being Atmanir Bharat. So I think I'll just stop there. No, Amit, you brought very, very important points. I think I agree to most of the points. And some of the points were more related to R&D and, uh, and others, I think. Uh, I would like to hear, and all of us are eager to hear uh, Dr. Mashalkar, uh, his thoughts uh, on this. But you are absolutely right about uh, pull versus push. Uh, and uh, it is about the business uh, solution, not a technology, uh, you know, fascination to technology and implementing those uh, technology. I think I agree to this. So I know it is 6.15. Uh, uh, there are so many things that we can yeah, discuss. Yeah. But this is a topic that is emerging very new. We need a lot of this discourse, but it's very important that we hear from Dr. Mashalkar and then possibly see whether we have some time to have further discussion. Address so, the questions, yeah. I would suggest that we do the Q&A first. I mean, to be fair to those people who have joined so us. There, uh, Mashalkar, sir, there might be some questions to you also. So if you suggest, we'll take the Q&A or uh, your remarks and your uh, you know, uh, inputs uh, will be welcome because there will be some questions to you also okay. maybe. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll try to be brief. You know, first of all, thank you, Arvind, uh, Izazbhai, Ruzuta, Amit, and Madhukar Rao. You are absolutely splendid. I learned so much during the last 75 minutes. Uh, you know, the, your deep insights uh, were uh, absolutely uh, incredible. Uh, I would uh, just make three or four key points. I think the first point is the issue of human-centric development that Madhukar Rao talked about. Human has to be at the center. There is no question about that at all as a matter of fact. And therefore, how do we do that? For example, technology with a human face, somebody mentioned about that. You talked about villages. You know, it's interesting. Uh, this is an issue of uh, civil society which I shared on the other day with Zazbari and Indar. Uh, there is a cover page story on Anjani Mahashankar Inclusive Innovation Awards. The 11 awardees who have created not best practice, but net practice. They're all digital solutions, which have the following characters. They're all diagnostics. They're non-invasive, so you don't require an expert. They're affordable, so villages can afford it. They're high tech. All right, higher stake as a matter of fact, because they are not best practice, next practice. And they are user-friendly, very, very user-friendly. All four characteristics that we need to do with It's incredible the way you have, have these young people, the uh, Yuva Shakti has thought about these problems rather than making money uh, to bring social good. I won't have time to sort of do that. Please uh, have, a, have a, a, a look at these, uh, uh, you know. So, Technology with a human face to create what you rightly said as India 4.0, not just Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 is a sub part of it as, as, as a uh, sort of uh, uh, a development assisted by digital transformation. That is number one. The second point I want to make, and I always repeat that, it is not about digitization, which are old processes that you digitize, basically, and you remain inefficient. But it is about digital transformation. I always give the simile of a caterpillar, basically. It has to be transformed to a butterfly. You can't convert a, but a, a caterpillar into a faster caterpillar. You remain where you are. So how do you do that digital transformation? That's why I like the word that Ruzuta used about digital culture. Because there, is, there has to be a mindset change, as a matter of fact. You know, the man and machine has to go together and there has to be that change. How do we do that? Is, is, uh, the question. The jobs, jobs, and jobs. I'm seeing from the Q and A uh, or the question that are being asked. There's a deep concern about jobs, and absolutely right. In fact, uh, somebody is uh, one expert had said that 70% of the kids 
uh, that are going into the school today will have jobs which don't exist. So what do you teach them? You talked about education. How do you teach for jobs which don't exist here? So you require certain fundamental uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, like dealing with complexity. Because there's a hookah word, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Not linear, but non-linear way of uh, you know, sort of doing it. Uh, COVID was receding, and then you got the Ukraine war, and it is affecting everyone. So complexity. Then uh, uh, cognitive uh, flexibility, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, and co-creation. It is not man versus machine. It is man and machine, basically. It's not robots. It is cobots uh, as, as we move along. So when we talk about industry 4.0 and industry 5.0, that's very human-centric, by the way. People are saying, you dealt with the productivity, you dealt with the efficiency. Now let's uh, 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 look at the human. Human can't be on the periphery. Human has to be at the center. And the final point I would like to make, because uh, <laughs> as people always say, dangerous optimists. See, uh, the story that is very close to my heart is the lilies in the pond. You know, there is this uh, pond where there are these lilies which have the habit of doubling up every day. That means on day two, there will be twice on day one. Question is, if the pond is full on day 30, what would it be on, uh, on uh, what, when would it be half full? 29, right? One day earlier. On 28, it will be quarter full. 27, it will be one eighth. And 26, it will be uh, 116, 116, 6%. So if you go there on the 26th day and look at the pond, what do you find? It is almost empty. Would you imagine that in four days that could be true? Now that's the model, that exponential thinking, aspirational, and uh, the thinking of abundance is what we need to have. I mean, all said and done, uh, uh, as uh, you know, uh, Izaz Bhai, for example, or Indian uh, IT experts, they were just $10 billion 20 years ago. Today, they are $150 billion. If you look at light emitting diets, seven years ago, it was just 0.8% penetration. Today, it is 80, 82% penetration, world's fastest. You have uh, already heard about Aadhaar and Jam and so on and so forth, how rapidly we have moved. So there have been exponential. Um, uh, I, I don't know how many of you heard about, uh, I mean, uh, uh, participated in the discussion that I had with uh, Mukesh Ambani. Uh, on, on the Asia economic uh, dialogue. 23 years ago, they were just a $1 billion market cap company. Today, they are $200 billion market cap company. And as he explained, it took them 15 years to move from 1 to 10, 5 years from 10 to 100, and 3 years from 100 to 200. I'm just giving exponential examples with an abundance mindset, pointed, pointed mindsets, and again, going back to lilies in the pond. India is lilies in the pond on the 26th day and we are talking about the 30th day so we can make it provided we just don't think about industry 4. Point, industry 4.0 will help us in the growth it is important to become an economically powerful nation as my guruji dr vijay kerkar always says uh, the best security for india is becoming an economically powerful nation and best strategy for india is 10 percent growth year after year as far as the security is concerned. So there is no denying about it, but it has to be an inclusive. That's the point. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Always enlightening, very inspiring. Uh, you know, listen to you. Every word, every sentence uh, penetrates into our minds and heart. Uh, I think. Thank you, sir. So uh, I know we are 623. Um, uh, Mandar should be Take yeah, we can take a, a couple of questions because uh, this was very uh, insightful and very amazing session. So people are really looking forward to uh, and, uh, listen to you know some more uh, inputs. Yeah. At least ten minutes of uh, Q and A. Yeah, 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 we will. And to get the maximum out of it, if the uh, questions can be brief and even the answers can be briefer, that would be great. Sure. So. Uh, so we have a few questions uh, here. Uh, the first one has come from uh, Mr. Jay Tarun. Uh, uh, they have not actually addressed whom the question is, but uh, the, he has two questions. You know, do you think that uh, by 2047, 
when we will be in a position to fully capitalize on industry 4.0 the world we will move to a different level altogether and do you think industry and academia is doing uh, enough to build the right talent to support this uh, so this is basically uh, based on his uh, in insights and inputs that he got uh, so i think uh, chinsur sir if you can just uh, elaborate on this and uh, uh, answer this question it will be nice so uh, as uh, we someone observed uh, in the chat uh, each industrial revolution took 100 years but fourth industrial revolution happened in 40 years of time so we don't know how quickly the fifth industrial revolution will happen it could be 20 years it could be 25 years or it could be less than that so uh, my uh, experience or gut feel says that industry 4.0 will peak in the next uh, 10 years and then i have already uh, you, know, you know mr mukesh ambani talks about fifth industrial revolution and he has his own version of uh, uh, fifth industrial revolution and there is a lot of discussion that is happening uh, in the uh, around the theme of fifth industrial revolution dr mashika said fifth industrial revolution will be human centric and i have my own thoughts about fifth industrial revolution i am saying that perhaps the consciousness becomes a very important uh element so uh, maybe later sometime i will elaborate my thoughts on fifth industrial revolution so uh, so he's right uh, therefore in the 2035 onwards we cannot just rely on becoming leader in fourth industrial revolution but we need to start thinking about uh, fifth industrial revolution or preparing for a fifth industrial revolution the mission 2047 includes fifth industrial revolution mr kotwal Yeah, I just want to add to what you said, two things come to mind immediately. One is the advent of 6G. Now, I'm sure it will happen in the next 15 years and it will completely transform uh, sharing of information, sharing of, you know, actually uh, having a, uh, the kind of interaction of a kind which we cannot even imagine today. The second is the, uh, the whole transformation that's taken place in the field of genetics and bioengineering or whatever you call it, the combination of engineering with biology. Now, this is going to take completely new turns and these two can be completely transformational even for India and therefore, this is not a goalpost which is static. It's a running goalpost and we have to keep running hard and be among the leading nations. It's not that we can ever be a leader in all cases. Thank you. So, uh Going to the next question, sir. Thank you so much for answering. Uh, I think Kotwal sir had briefed about you know going to the uh, villages and rural India, focusing there with the technology. This question is very relevant by Mr. Nagaraj Reddy, uh, asking uh, is how important is inclusion of tier two and tier three cities to gain maximum GDP benefit of forty trillion US dollars? So, uh, uh, Kotwal sir, uh, if you can take this question. Yeah, uh, so there are two aspects here. We can reach uh, trillions of dollars in many routes we can follow. But what is more important in developing tier three now, in fact, we should look at tier three and even the smaller villages, is not really for only looking at the trillions we get, but mm -hmm. from the transformation we will have in job growth where it really matters and it, in improving the standard of living in those places, which really matter. So trillions will come out of maybe big and small and maybe medium industries in various places adopting the technologies which have been enumerated but they will you know it's going to be difficult to have progress in those areas tier three cities for example it is going to be difficult but that is the that thing which we need to tackle the rest of it will take care of itself in a, in a way thank you if yes sir master sir yes sir i'm just coming on this question that's a very important question tier two tier three uh, cities you know uh, somebody said, what is it that India does once a week? And the answer was that we create one unicorn a week. Unicorn, as you know, is a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, value, one billion valuation stuff. One dollar. Yeah, okay. Now, this was unheard of five years ago. This has happened today. That's number one. That is, again, the ladies in the pond store. The second part is that uh, uh, last year we had, uh, I mean, the total was 88, out of which when it had reached some 50, 55, I did an analysis. I thought they would be coming from IITs and IIMs and so on and so forth, you know, the IB institutions. No, 
fifty percent plus of them were from tier two, tier three cities, and some of them were dropouts. Can you just imagine a tier two, tier three city, twenty six, twenty eight year young boy having a market cap of a you know, several hundred million? Dollars? You know, so what? Why that has happened is that digital access, like I say, access equality, right? Because the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, the cloud was there. We took care of storage, the software, open source software that took care of that. The data, and, and, and as you know, uh, the, sort of uh, the cheapest uh, in the world, like mobile data consumption, four rupees per GB, and so on. So all these factors allowed this tier three young boy to do something which would not have been able to do. So access equality, despite income inequality. That is the solution. Agree. Uh, I'm sitting in Hubli, uh, where it is India's largest incubator. So I'm leading that. So I'm 250 startups. Amazing. You know they are competing with Bose and many other uh, music systems. Good. I think you so can ask question now because we are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this this is exactly now. I want to take this question, which is important because this is exactly opposite to what we said about smart technology, digital digitalization. Uh, Mr. Rajendra Arande has a concern. He's saying, "What do you propose about products which are not smart? Should it be scrapped and declared as obsolete as its coexistence integration may lead to uneconomical situation?" So he has a concern, and I don't. Think so. It's much of a concern because everybody is slowly get into the smart world and smart technology. So, Chinchura sir, would you like to you know uh, uh, relieve his concern? No, Mandar, you answered it. <laughs> so, because of the time, I think you said yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think uh, looking at the time, uh, we would uh, take these questions offline. I can uh, take this and uh, send it to you to address it later. Uh, so, uh, with this, I would like to you know. Uh, thank each one of you and uh, again wish everybody present here a very good evening to all uh, it it is such an honor for me to get this opportunity to thank you all dignitaries on behalf of the pic team i would like to express my gratitude to mashilkar sir and all esteemed speakers of the webinar for the presence and contribution to make this webinar a great success uh, thank you for inspiring and encouraging us with your valuable insights so for best insight that which i could actually take away from this round table was the This paper that presents the three-step framework of rapid, inclusive, and sustainable development that will put India among the world world's leaders in industry by the hundredth year of its independence, and the three phases which I it will get it will stick to us uh, are will be in the form of Mission 2025, which will be initiated to establish, integrate to grow, and multiply to lead. Uh, doubtless, uh, the roadmap requires concentrated efforts and diligent implementation implementation to deliver the desired results. So, this was something which was highlighted, which I felt like uh, addressing. And uh, I would also like to thank the PIC team, uh, Abhay Vaidya Sir, Kiran Pardeshi, and Ambrish for helping uh, to make this webinar uh, very successful. And all the participants, thank you, uh, everyone. One second, uh, I'll just like to announce the. Um, Upcoming, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll just uh, <laughs> say something before you. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think uh, uh, the highlight of today's uh, uh, event is the last comment that has been made by Dr. Ashok Desai, who said that this program should have been at least half a day. Half a day. <laughs> I always consider the success is when uh, people who present speak shorter than they uh, uh, do. And the question answer session goes much longer yes, than yes, it was yes. meant to be. And this suggestion about half a day implies that we have uh, uh, sort of uh, made some sense. So absolutely, I'm grateful to sort of uh, all of that. That that's what I want to say. Yeah. In fact, I was also uh, asking Rujita how she could cover such a wonderful, exhaustive presentation in just ten minutes. It's absolutely. and I requested requested her for the presentation. Yeah. So coming to the uh, next uh, event announcement. uh we have this uh, book discussion webinar uh, prize of the modi years uh, which is scheduled on the 29th of march uh, which is a tuesday from 6 pm to 7 pm in in standard time and uh, the author and speaker is mr akar patel who is the chair of amnesty india our own vice president of pune national center dr vijay kelkar will be the chairperson and discussant will be mr shankar ayer analyst author and columnist and member of uh, pune international center 
So do up, stay updated on our website and we will soon get in touch with you with the link to register for this event and look forward to see you all in our upcoming event. And I uh, thank you all once again uh, for your contribution to this wonderful seminar, uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.